Okay, let's begin. So, uh, one more lecture, and then we're off to the race. Um, so, Nirmal, uh, thanks for coming. And your mouth is uh, even more local than Colin. <laughs> uh, so I don't know, our version Mason is from here. Half an hour, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, and your mouth is doing some very nice work. So uh, I'll, I'll let him introduce himself. Thank you, JP. Thank you for, for, for the introduction. Uh, today I'll talk about uh, synthesis and characterization of chemical uh, materials. So I'll keep it, try to keep it general. But uh, I'll kind of uh, uh, talk about these uh, synthesis and characterization methods in terms of uh, the materials that we are uh, working on. We have uh, worked on this. So, to uh, you know, put things into perspective, uh, what I do or my group does is that we are, uh, you know, group. group. Um, we synthesize uh, materials, mostly focus on, on single crystal uh, materials. And uh, then we do some sort of uh, uh, property measurement also. So, there is this. And characterization of the materials. And one of the material systems that we're currently working on is the cable uh, material. And uh, in terms of measurement, um, you know, we sometimes uh, make trips to a high magnetic field lab. Uh, and then we sometimes also use the nuclear facility, sometimes ourselves very limited, our refraction, uh, small energy scattering. And we collaborate a lot um, in, in nuclear refraction experiment, uh, uh, you know, also some data. That we have uh, uh, taken with uh, collaborating, collaborating with and uh, we will be talking more about human scattering tomorrow. Okay, and um, first of all, I will give thanks um, to uh, you know my group members and uh, uh, my collaborators at really different places. So <clears throat> what I'll uh, talk about is basically you know a brief introduction about the cable materials. Uh, then uh, you know I'll particularly focus on one of these uh, system of um, this 166 uh, family of uh, system. And then, then with respect to this, I'll talk about a bit about synthesis and their magnetic electronic electrical properties, um, and then some you know tuning up magnetism because here we are on, on, on the you know materials workshop. So how we think about uh, the you know design properties in materials uh, you know with respect to this this system. Then I'll summarize that up. So uh, the word kegomi, um, uh, many of you might have already been uh, familiar with this, comes from the Japanese word that means a basket, something like that. If we look at it into the basket, uh, uh, we can see these triangles here, the uh, little triangles that are causing at least uh, this arms, arms here in triangles. So a lattice in which atoms um, are arranged in such a way that they, the, um, you know, they, are, they, they are part of these corner here in triangles are uh, just called the Tegomi uh, materials. Now, what is interesting about this Tegomi is that these systems have been studied uh, for a long time, even in 1950s, uh, right? Um, this system was considered to be one of the very highly trusted systems, uh, then uh, regarded as a uh, candidate for um, steel liquid, which we just heard um, from Colin, the, the Boston talk uh, from Colin about him. He, he, he saw, um, you know, his, uh, uh, talks uh, in the uh, material. Then uh, more recent, the interest on these materials is, is uh, coming from the electronic structure of these materials. Uh, and, and, and the reason is that in a uh, high finding model, it gives, uh, you know, especially in two-dimensional living, it gives uh, two sets of um, uh, features. One is this uh, linearly crossing bands, and they are called direct um, crossings, and this point is the direct point. As well as the flat, this direct crossing, which is very highly dispersive, as well as the presence of uh, the flat band um, simultaneously. These are two extreme limits of, uh, of the electronic capacity, right? One is highly dispersive, one is completely flat, comes together in this system. And each of them has very interesting properties. For example, flat bands are uh, highly dissonant state and they can give rise to uh, you know, fractional quantum poly effect and, and so on. Whereas these uh, graph points have, um, you know, many other interesting properties, and I'll, I'll kind of briefly uh, mention about this uh, this feature. 
why this this is considered so interesting is it dates back to again uh, this discovery of uh, the quantum polytech that, that was on a couple of times here. And uh, the um, when uh, von Klintig put these two dimensional material uh, in a high magnetic field, is a, is a polypack. In normal material, a polypack is considered to be a linear magnetic field, but it shows this kind of sets and then quantized uh, to a value of s over e squared, basically the hardware. And that led to uh, people uh, think about this use of topology in the system. And one of the, I'm not going into the details of this, but what I'm taking you to, to our things, how people were thinking about, about this. This was completely, you know, uh, experimental work, right? They didn't expect this to happen, but they just saw it. Now, when people started thinking about it, uh, one of the things, again, the, the, the work uh, that got known by 2016 was, was Helen was thinking uh, in the same step of, can we kind of get the same effect? Because here, uh, in this effect, you have to apply the magnetic field in order to quantize the polygon. Uh, right? Can it be done without the application of the magnetic field? Was something that he was, he was thinking. And in his noble lecture notes, he even mentioned that it was completely fictional at that time because uh, uh, there was no indication that people could make uh, this uh, you know, uh, single layer of graphing because he was uh, kind of making his choice so based on the graphing. And uh, what uh, you know, interesting thing he uh, got uh, in his toy model is that if he can break the time to symmetry in the system, but I mean, this little arrow he puts uh, magnetic type of it, right? Then what it does is that uh, the, the, the graphing has this type of band structure where the balance bands and conduction and plotting is it's a nice semi right? It opens a gap at this place. The gap can be opened uh, in two ways, the break breaking the inverse symmetry or uh, the uh, kind of symmetry. Inverse symmetry breaking um, is it's pretty much trivial because it puts a gap here, but when it uh, comes to the opening a gap by breaking the time difference symmetry, then the, there is this non-trivial um, uh, eight states developed in the system, and that leads to the quantization of the hall. So that was the first indication of this quantum anomalous hall effect theoretically. So this, you know, Tegome system having this uh, uh, Dirac crossing now, uh, you know, gets us a system where you know potentially if uh, the kind of symmetry can be broken, that system will get if the gap can be open, and that can uh, lead, uh, that can give rise to the uh, quantum anomalous quality. That's kind of one of the interesting features. Another interesting feature, as I mentioned to you before, is that there is kind of a lot of uh, interesting spins. There are a lot of frustration in this system, right? Make, so it can be a very uh, nice playground for uh, the interplay of magnetism, topology, flat band, and everything. That's uh, the kind of uh, interest in, uh, that is why this Egomi uh, system is one of the very interesting systems uh, in material. So what interesting thing has been observed in this material? I'll kind of give you a brief uh, kind of introduction about a few of the materials here. One of them is magnetism chain. Um, uh, where uh, the spins kind of uh, arranged in a non collinear way uh, in, in the Tegome labs. And because of that, this is the first time so that uh, this non collinearity can give rise to a large and most polygon. You know, in the, in the you know, uh, earlier days, it was used to think that this number of polygon can come from only ferromagnetic, right? Not from any ferromagnetic. And in 2013 time frame, um, there were theories predicting that in non collinear uh, System also that can be uh, uh, the anomalous polypack, and it was uh, in probably the first uh, experiment that was demonstrating that because coming from the non collinearity arranged in a in a system. Another interesting uh, system is iron grid seen to where uh, it has a, you know these um, iron atom mix the tegome and that is this type shown here, but it has uh, two tegome system nearby, so bilayer tegome system. And uh, they, uh, the interesting feature in this uh, is that when you have, and this is a ferromagnet. So when there is a ferromagnet um, and there is a spin arm coupling, you can open a gap at these places and can give rise to uh, large and most polypic. And that was uh, all about, they observed this gap in this, in this system in nervous measurement. That's all about in, in this case. Another system, cobalt, came uh, to software too. It has uh, these um, tegomy bits of uh, the cobalt atom here, 
And uh, there are, you know, why do we use these like this material? But one of the uh, interesting features is, is here that uh, when spin orbit coupling is, is included in this uh, system, it opens a gap here, and that gives rise to orbital line. There is uh, another interesting feature. Another one is iron team. And in this iron team, uh, it was first, uh, you know, the special thing about this iron team is, is that uh, it, it is uh, uh, people uh, from, from my team were able to show that both of these flat bands and their reference coexist in this material. Um, and, and it was one of the, uh, you know, agonic systems for the first time was observed. Um, these systems are far away from uh, the carbon energy, so, you know, it's not clear how much they can contribute to the company. But uh, they were observed. Okay. So now, which one is far away from? So you know this is close, but this one is way above uh, the the, the so carbon. Close to the direct one. Yeah, direct one is close to the carbon, but the flat band is. Uh, and then uh, the, one of the things that around uh, you know 2018, 19 time frame. I was thinking about this chemical system and trying to find out another material. I saw that uh, one of these materials are very, all these materials are very interesting, right? But there are certain problems with these materials. The fact is that, you know, as we mentioned, that chemical system are a playground for these interesting electronic and magnetic properties of freedom, right? But can we team and use this system to view this magnetism or the electronic property? It's pretty, I found that pretty hard because. In, in many of these tin, uh, you know, if you look at into the materials data, database, there are a lot of compounds of that uh, crystal structure. But there are only two compounds that have been well studied. One is many lithium, another is many in Germany. I didn't three uh, in also people have studied, but not much. And it might be related to the strict requirement to form this non polymers in state. Another uh, in iron 3 T2, there are maybe hardly two or three compounds reported so far. And, and similarly in this, in this uh, in, uh, structure of this material as well. Um, and in iron tin, uh, there's iron cobalt that, that has been well studied. Uh, and maybe there is another one uh, that, that uh, those who have been at MIT is recently working, but not many. So if you want to kind of tune these materials, kind of uh, change the properties and investigate uh, them, uh, these are not that much flexible. And what I was looking for is kind of looking for a system that is more flexible, where you know you have a direct, you know, this heavenly system as well as a flexible enough that you can change these magnetic elements and it go into this system, keeping the structure same, so that you know you can uh, tune the properties, uh, magnetic properties, electronic properties, and so on. And that's when I kind of uh, realized that this system, this R M six system, is a really nice system. And very highly flexible in the sense that you know, see how many. This is the structure where uh, you know here I put this figure for yttrium, but it's, it's true for uh, most of the R atoms. Also, when you replace yttrium with with these R atoms, these R atoms form slightly distorted structure goes into a, a different stress group, and then you can change uh, the um, these black atoms, which are manganese here. You can change with any of them here. It remains the same structure. And you can replace tin with germanium with the same structure. You can kind of dope this tin with indium, gallium, um, maybe lead, uh, and uh, maybe try this antimony, but uh, it remains in, uh, into the same structure. So very highly flexible system, including these, this, uh, this, uh, you know, the uh, uh, 3D uh, fancy metal um, atoms forming the candy here. And um, on top of that, um, you know, this structure itself is very interesting. And why is that? Is that these, uh, you know, uh, the pink, blue, and uh, the uh, bay balls are tin atoms. If you look at into the, this, this manganese layers, between these two layers, these are separated by just tin, uh, a, a block of tin, right? So the extra interaction between them two has, has one type. Whereas the interaction between this and that is different, can be different. And it's because this is a different block. And if you take, uh, you know, another uh, uh, you know, nearest interaction, then it can build, can, has, can have this inbuilt 
frustration out, out of plane process, right? Uh, into layer frustration in the system. So it can drive very interesting magnetic properties into the system because of that. So uh, now, uh, you know, crystal growth. Uh, yesterday, we uh, had kind of um, heard um, very nice uh, talks about the crystal growth, plot uh, from Brian, and, um, and there were like a lot, a lot of talk about phase drag and so on. Basically, this uh, RMT uh, is uh, in the crystal grows with uh, plus maker. So here, I just wanted to mention to you that Brian is, you know, mentioned that uh, flux growth is just like dissolving salt into water and, and, and crystallizing, right? You can do maybe with, uh, with Alan, uh, you know, you can buy things like in Target or Walmart, uh, there is just a growth uh, kit. You can actually test at home. And these are the crystals that my um, daughter brought there, made at home. So <laughs> somebody, had to, uh, somebody had to give me uh, this, this package, uh, but it lived with them. So my knew that crystal growth and the kids loved it. The thing is that you, you kind of dissolve uh, uh, this alum very easily in the, in the, you know, very easy to do it and, and uh, you know, it's pretty safe to do it. And then, uh, you know, uh, dissolving water and then you heat it and, and then increase the um, insolubility, right? Then leave it for a, a day, day or two, then you will get these kind of crystals. You can just dump the water out into the sink, right? That is, that is a plastic. You are precipitating crystals. And you're dumping the flux. So what we do with these materials when we have metals in there is we use metal as a flux now. And uh, then you know we saw this in yesterday also, so I'll not go into the details of it. Here we, you know, in, tin is a good flux because it has low melting point, high boiling point, and then it can uh, react with many other um, materials, right? So we use tin as a flux. These are the you know, pictures of some of the crystals grown with uh, with. Uh, Flux meter, so I'm not going into the details of kind of skip them. Uh, this was also something I kind of intended to talk about as an example of how a flux growth is done since these things have been covered yesterday. I'll just uh, go past through this. And here, you know, uh, why tin can uh, act as a, as a uh, self flux is that tin can dissolve. This is a phase diagram between uh, uh, tin and yttrium. So, at very large concentration of, of tin, it can dissolve uh, somewhere at 600 or uh, slightly about 600. Uh, in three months, right? It just uh, uh, you just require um, you know large amount of tin to solve it. That's for manganese, it is it is much easier. So the, the phase diagram, this whole thing is liquid, so it's not a problem for it. So tin can dissolve with yttrium and uh, and manganese, and it's true for uh, almost all of these layers that comes into the system. So tin self flux. So since, since we are using tin to go a tin compound, it's kind of just a self flux. And you get crystals, something like that, when you centrifuge out, right? When you centrifuge uh, to throw out, just like you know, we dump water into the sink, uh, we have to dump out this excess uh, metal fluid while it is hot. We use centrifuge to, the, to that, and you see these crystals. These are actually crystals of your And uh, you know, this is a crystal of this uh, germanium doped uh, Ethermanian existence. It look, you know, uh, the morphology, you know, comes so beautiful, right? It looks perfect, exactly. Uh, just, just to add. Then the thing is about characterizing. Now, uh, you know, uh, the first thing when we get crystals out of the oven or the furnace is that we want to see whether, you know, I get uh, this thing that I want to make or not. Right? The first I is uh, the characterize. And uh, the easiest thing is, is the powder crack because you grind it and you make millions of uh, these tiny uh, crystallites. And the hope is that the crystallites are there is in all different uh, sorts of uh, orientation that's available to the, to the X ray beam. And then, you know, uh, this is all about uh, the, the uh, satisfying the Bragg's condition, right? And uh, since Bragg's condition is sine theta and lambda, uh, you know, 2D is uh, 2 uh, sine inverse uh, lambda over, uh, you know, 2D. So for each plane, we have certain D, right? And so uh, whenever that uh, you know, certain uh, you know phase uh, is is uh, is um, uh, the, the beam sees that certain phase, and it satisfies uh, the condition uh, for that particular angle, right? And then you get a constructing interference, so you get a peak here. And then if, if there is no plane available, there is no uh, constructing interference, so you don't see any peak here. That's how you get these uh, uh, peaks in, in the power diffraction pattern. You can uh, analyze that, uh, that, that pattern to uh, kind of uh, 
uh, figure out which structure it, or the, is it the structure that you want it or not. And then you know, if the atoms are arranged perfectly, uh, you know, how hard these um, uh, atoms are, uh, or what's the last parameters in, in many different ways. So, so this is our characteristics. Now, the, another thing. When we uh, grow materials um, in the lab, what we do is we uh, have to measure it, right? That's the most important thing. Uh, just having a crystal, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense. How beautiful it is, right? We need to do the measurement. What to do the measurement? So, one of the advantages in having a single crystal is that now we, we can do directional dependent measurement. And the first thing to do that is we need to know what direction it is. So um, that is uh, something that uh, you know uh, sometimes can be very complicated. If you grow a crystal from a floating zone, you know you don't have idea where uh, the faces are. You might need more sophisticated equipments like uh, lower emission and things like that to figure out which uh, uh, direction, which faces are which direction, right? But for uh, flux grown crystal, and to some extent uh, even in uh, chemical uh, transport grown crystals, they come with this nice uh, faces, right? And uh, they are yeah, really easy to orient and something most of the time you can orient them using even powder capacitor. You just have to make a thin or have to figure out a way how to mount that um, uh, sample properly. And, and, and uh, you know, this was oriented using uh, the powder capacitor. Uh, that's in my lab, and you can get easily reflection from the C axis for hexagonal. Hexagonal, getting A if A axis is pretty uh, tough, but you know, the symmetry uh, is very helpful. Now, because you know, because of the symmetry, one one zero is the same as uh, one zero um, in hexagonal system, and it turns out that one one zero has this uh, right geometry that you can get a reflection from that, and then that's how uh, you can orient this hexagonal crystal. Then you start measuring uh, the magnetic property. Here, I so the susceptibility of, of this particular compound between magnetic insects, and we're measuring susceptibility as a function of temperature. We see this, uh, you know. Uh, First um, transition here. Right? And uh, this transition is kind of funny because it's kind of not very sharp, and then there's a small little bit of window we saw. So I think sometimes you know, can be ignored. But uh, so you get that uh, this small wiggle had some meaning um, and, and uh, some structural change in, in terms of magnetism happens at that, at that place. And when we measure the electrical resistivity, Electrical resistivity, you know, changes smoothly through this transition. Usually, you see transitions at magnetic transitions, um, uh, so some sort of peak feature like that. But uh, there was small kind of uh, uh, you know uh, pink here, and it becomes visible in uh, in the in the derivative. It changes, it changes, so it's changed only at 330 Kelvin. What might have happened is that in, in this system there is a lot of fluctuations. So the fluctuations um, killed uh, that, that pink feature here, but it's still persisted here at 330 Kelvin. And there is two transitions here, that means um, uh, in, in this system. So what should we do if we you know, want to know what is happening here? Because these are all magnetic uh, behaviors, right? We need to know what kind of magnetic uh, structure uh, is formed in this material. And uh, now um, we just heard a lot of uh, talk about the neutron diffraction, right? And neutrons have the, at the moment. So as like the X-ray can see the crystal structure, because X-rays can interact with electrons, and that's how we see it. we determine the uh, structure of uh, these crystals. So neutrons have uh, the, the moments, and those moments can interact with the spins um, uh, in, in, in this material, and that can help us to determine the magnetic structure. So uh, we kind of collaborated with uh, with Jeff and his, and his group. And uh, carried out uh, the neutron diffraction experiment in this uh, in the system, and we see um, like there, there there is one single dot here, right, at high temperature, and then it bifurcates into two. There are kind of two wave vectors. Um, that's probably not more, more important. More important thing is that it kind of bifurcates into two. What does that mean is that it tells us that okay, the location is also important, right? It is happening at point five. It tells us about the periodicity of uh, that. Um, Magnetic structure. So see here, this is uh, kind of its layer, and in this system, two layers. Uh, in a unit cell, there are two layers of magnetic atom, and um, so after two unit cells, it is kind of uh, repeating. These are two are on the on, on this side, two are on the other side, and then it repeats right after four unit cells. Um, after two unit cells, so one over two is 0.5. That is the meaning of this. So uh, you know, 
at, at high temperature, it forms this fully year and intermediate phase. And as it cools down here, what happens is that these things kind of uh, uh, form a different structure at low temperature below here and helping only this structure. This is a spiral structure that kind of rotates in a, uh, a little bit uh, funny way. Uh, and then um, in between these uh, two phases, uh, two kind of magnetic structure quakes. Here in 33 Kelvin, uh, you know, this phase starts appearing. That was a uh, kind of uh, impact and result here. Now, the next thing is that, you know, how does this uh, material behave under magnetic field is another um, interesting question, right? So uh, when we put magnetic field along the um, um, perpendicular to C-axis or in the plane uh, of that material, then these blue um, curves are, are for that. And we see a lot of interesting features here. First, there is a, a linear chain, and then there is a big jump here. Then, then there is another linear chain, and there is this cusp like feature, and there are a bit of wiggles here, and then it's that. When you increase temperature, uh, this feature disappears, and only uh, these uh, features kind of survive there. And when you kind of measure this along C axis, and the other orientation, the, it is kind of pretty much featureless, kind of grows, uh, you know, uh, monotonically, right? So this kind of uh, type of measurement. You know, uh, tells us that uh, there are a lot of magnetic um, structures that are forming. The magnetic field can change this kind of thing, right? Uh, and, and we map out this by making more sensitive uh, measurement phase that will be measured directly with the derivative of this. So we can see that there is one phase, two phase, three, and this is a force per magnetic field when the magnetic field, the magnetic field polarizes all the spins. And then there are these little um, uh, pockets now as well. Now so again, yes. Um, you showed um, the stability as a function of temperature before, right. and you showed that it has two features. At what field did you measure that? Oh, the system no, was temperature. Yeah, it was was uh, point one. Oh, okay. So, so it's below all the. Um, oh, sorry. I went to the wrong direction. Okay. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Point point one. Yes. It's, it's there. Okay. Um, and then, then what is the next step? You can keep in mind what these magnetic structures are, right? So then again, there's a different kind of experiment um, using magnetic field. And then this, this line at uh, these, um, you know, two um, places are, are the, uh, the Q vector of two are the uh, nuclear field. And these are the magnetic brackets. And we can see that here at low field, it doesn't change that much. And then, Right at the place where it jumps, there is a small kind of change. And then here, it kind of goes back and then it kind of develops another uh, feature. There are two uh, peaks that are here. This is quite inter interesting. And uh, then we kind of, I won't go into the details of, of this, but you know, when we uh, measure at a function of uh, temperature, then what happens is that we can map each uh, these, uh, these features um, you know, appearing exactly as the way that we were measuring in. Uh, we're we're obtaining in the many uh, you know susceptibility or or mechanism. Now then, uh, you know we uh, got a lot of help uh, from um, from Igor here in the audience to understand what these uh, you know the microscope origin of these uh, structures, and we figured out that okay this this first phase uh, that that, um, that develops in this material is that the magnetic field distorts this a little bit. Uh, and then when there is a jump here, uh, the spins uh, were, were originally in the plane, uh, and then they kind of flop out of the plane, very non-trivial, right? When you apply magnetic field in this direction, the spins goes like that. Uh, that this is what's happening. And then since the magnetic field is forcing them, uh, they can't a little bit and form this type of uh, spiral. That's what transport point of spiral. And this is all about energetics, right? And then, uh, you know, these spins now, uh, find easier to move this way. Um, you know, it's all, all kind of uh, calculations, calculations of these energies for the, for the different states. Again, to go back into the plane when you increase magnetic field. And when they go back, they kind of uh, um, form a very uh, kind of um, uh, 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 interesting magnetic uh, structure, just like, you know, if I project it in, uh, in the plane, uh, on the direction of the magnetic field, it looks like, just like that. And when I kind of um, resolve this, each of the components in the direction of the magnetic field and perpendicular to that in the plane, 
then I get this periodicity, right? Here, four uh, layers make one, uh, you know, two unit cells, right? These are repeating after two unit cells. Uh, and, uh, you know, two unit cells is one over two is 0.5. That's why this peak, that second little peak, and that was observed here. And, uh, and when, when if, if we look at into this component, this does not repeat until eight unit cells. And it repeats after eight unit cells. So it's one over 8.25. That's why we see this point. That's how we understood like this, this interesting magnetic structure. And this. Why we, I, I'm talking about is that you have, you know, these, you need to understand these uh, magnetic phases to understand other classical problems, uh, which I will kind of get into today. Now I will with this map after this magnetic problem. I will take you to uh, the classical problem. And uh, classical, uh, one of the things that people measure usually in the technical system, uh, as, I, as I showed you earlier, is the anomalous hollow. So Hall effect is basically, uh, you know, was discovered by Hall a long time ago, actually in Johns Hopkins University. And then <coughs> here, um, you know, for a normal uh, conductor, the Hall, uh, the Hall resistance that is linear with, with the magnetic field. But if there is ferromagnetism, then what happens is that uh, the um, Hall effect kind of follows uh, the magnetization to some extent. And uh, then, um, you know, even in zero magnetic field, you can measure which is uh, which is different from this, right? That is called anomalous polyphase that, that was uh, and also discovered by all uh, maybe uh, a year later when you after discovering first uh, first the polyphase. Now um, the anomalous polyphase has been kind of uh, you know measured in in this uh, system to see that uh, you know the gap feature. And then as I mentioned to you that, uh, you know, what has been predicted is that the anomalous holotype can get quantized type. For the anomalous holotype to get quantized, the gap has to be exactly at points of and no other bands needs, you know, uh, should be there. And, um, uh, but, you know, these are three dimensions of a very complicated system, right? So you may not get the full and then the, uh, the uh, quantization. And then it also occurs depends on the location of where these, um, uh, you know, uh, direct uh, crossings are in uh, related to the formula. And that is the argument that was made in this, uh, in this paper where, where you know, there, there is this uh, you know, paramagnetic behavior, the Hall effect kind of follows this behavior. And then uh, there are many, you know, many uh, uh, scaling behaviors. One of them is that if you plot this uh, you know, sigma x square um, as a function of uh, the anomalous Hall effect, and if it is linear, that indicates the intrinsic contribution. So at least the intercept will give you the intrinsic contribution of the animal solitude, meaning that animal solitude can come from some, some sort of impurity scattering. Um, but the intrinsic part that is coming from band structure has to be linear uh, with the sigma x square. Sigma x square is, is the long sigma resistance, the normal resistance that we measure for the magnetic resistance or conductivity. And this one is uh, the animal one. And uh, you know the argument in this paper is that since uh, you have these uh, uh, kind of gaps, these gaps uh, give finite um, you know, all conductivity, and that is what they are missing. So the another uh, interesting uh, feature um, in not only in Kegelian system, but since Kegelian system can form interesting magnetic texture, another uh, you know um, uh, interesting measurement is the coupleless topology. Uh, so this is slightly different uh, from the animal subject, which happens at zero magnetic field, and it comes from uh, basically sometimes from the speed vector that many just like in many can, but uh, some you know, most of the time it's kind of band structure, thing, right? That in that case, the um, non-collinear it affects the um, band structure anyway. And then in this case, when you have this type of uh, um, magnetic texture. With kind of scurrying on this, uh, in, in this piece are pointing all up here. When you go to the next layer, they are slightly candid. And then when you go to the center, they are kind of facing downwards. Now, when an electron moves through this texture, what happens is that the electrons follow. Uh, they, this, mo this mo motion has to be adiabatic. That means this electron needs to follow all these local spin directions. And it kind of goes like that. Goes, and then when it comes out, it comes again back, right? So it starts from one point um, and comes back to this point. And during that time, what it does is that it, it accumulates a phase factor. And that, that phase factor is uh, uh, a geometrical phase factor. Now we know that it has a very, just like this, I mean, you can try it. And so you here, you take hand like this, 
Um, and then I'm pointing this arm here. Um, and you can everybody see me doing this. So see, I will not twist my um, uh, forearm, okay? And I'll give you a rotation like this. And then I'll go here and come back. Did you see the change in, if this is a spin direction, right? This is a vector. See? Go like that, come here, go back. Did you see that change? What I did is I kind of moved into this three dimensional curve space and that gave a change, right? That's entirely because of uh, the geometry. And that is similar things happening to the web function of this electron when it moves through this texture. And it picks up that geometrical space. That's a very space. And this thing is not even in quite undergraduate level quantum mechanics. So you go far enough up to that, uh, that, uh, that part, which is kind of towards the last, last chapters in the, in the methods. That, uh, you know, this very space um, can act as a fictitious memory. Now, what you have is you have a fictitious magnet inside a material, and you have a charged particle moving through it. What will happen is it experience an extra Lorentz force. And Hall effect is all about measuring the Lorentz force, right? So you have some additional contribution to that. And that additional contribution uh, comes as an additional particle that we call topological particle, right? Here in this particular kind of magnet set aside, there is a discrepant phase into this region. And when they measured this Hall effect and subtracted the normal component, what they found is that only in this region they have these, these non zero uh, uh, values, right? Now, all of the things that's kind of pretty much fair. So that contribution is, is coming from that topological aspect. It's called topological Hall effect. The reason I'm telling you is that we observe this topological Hall effect in, in this compound in six, in 6 as well. So we have, you know, this. A great care has to be taken actually uh, in interpreting these things because we have to kind of subtract a lot of uh, other components. See how many different components the total Hall effect when you are measuring the normal component that's linear, right? Then and all those all components, then there is curve magnetism, some sort of curve magnetism associated with that. Then comes the topological Hall effect. So you have to kind of subtract that those two, two parts. And sometimes one funny thing is that sometimes this hysteresis, if it is it, history. And a great care has to be taken, you know, to measure in the same way both uh, the reals uh, and as well as the magnetism. Otherwise, uh, it can be some sort of uh, artifact, right? Um, one of you know my postdoc came to me. We were measuring a different uh, compound, the same same uh, group. He said, "Oh, I got this uh, uh, very large almost uh, effect when we uh, redo it properly by kind of uh, uh, taking care of the." the Hysteresis and it's gone. So uh, it needs to be very carefully analyzed. But what we found is that actually this material does have this, uh, uh, this kind of when we uh, properly subtract in this uh, range and at high temperature only. At low temperature, we don't see it. it happens only at high temperature. This was reported by another group also while we were working. Uh, they did a wonderful job of making this case diagram we have to make therefore. And uh, so, you know, the Hall effect appears only in this in this region, right, at high temperature. The question is, why is it appearing only at high temperature and not appearing at low temperature? Certainly, there's an effect of temperature. What temperature does, in fact, it uses fluctuations in, the, in, in this speed system. So again, it is a unity of, uh, of Igor that, uh, that um, he uh, kind of um, uh, created a model where uh, the fluctuations actually can uh, generate uh, this, this type of topological um, uh, Hall effect. This model kind of boils down to a very simple formula that relates this dx is this uh, is, um, is proportional to um, uh, uh, the, the um, Hall effect, right? So this um, Hall effect is, you know, here, if I'm measuring at constant temperature, um, uh, it is, has this uh, kind of, or, or if I'm measuring at constant mg and a particular x is linear in t. And if I'm measuring at um, a constant temperature, then it has to follow this relation. And we, we kind of show that both of these uh, features test. Yes. Do you have a simple uh, understanding of the sign of the topological component? Whether it's like in your, your, your data, I mean, like, whether it's positive or negative. This is, you know, just um, from the soft, uh, soft, soft right? Like, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't have answers. Maybe it is uh, the, um, 
Well, I mean, in the theory. I, I, I don't think we kind of, um, at least I haven't. In, in, okay. Okay. All right. We probably do that. Okay. Because we stopped back. Yes. Question. But I was also interested in that question because, in principle, you could kind of turn, I mean, when you have a hole effect in the absence of a magnetic field, then the field is not there to kind of give direction. You might ask if you rotate the sample by 180 degrees. Will there actually be a sign change? Probably, but um, we did we didn't do it. We didn't uh, rotate the sample. But that's something good. Okay. And the next thing is the magnetic resistance. Another property is how the resistance uh, changes with uh, the magnetic field, right? And this particular system, it was again very interesting. Kind of resistance, um, uh, you know, we observed that. Here, uh, you know, uh, let's see, let's first look at into the magnetic. You have this this thing. I already saw these all these things. You know, I'm showing you on only up to nine Tesla, so that the cost and then it's saturated over here. Now you, you measure the resistance with current along C axis. Then you see like uh, where there is <coughs> huge zombie magnetic. There is uh, you know negligible change in, in, in the resistance. But then there is a big change here where there's no change in uh, the magnetics in the system. And you kind of change the direction of the current by in the same direction. Then, uh, you know, this, this feature is there, but not muted. And then this, this feature is, uh, is uh, one. Um, uh, and uh, here, uh, you know, if you, what you do is you apply magnetic field in, in, in along the C axis where the, where, uh, the magnetization is pretty kind of uh, featureless. You still see this drop here um, uh, in this range. Here it happens at four Tesla, here it happens at five Tesla, uh, but then in the other direction it's kind of muted, still there. Yes. It, how, what's the anisotropy in the transport? Um, it has some sort of anisotropy. I, I had that measurement um, on A and B axis, but I didn't put it there. Uh, small anisotropy, small, small. Yes. And what this tells us is that, you know, you know when the uh, Magnetism is talking to the electronic property through the spin arc coupling. The fact that uh, that this big jump has very small effect on, on the on the magnetic transport property is that uh, the spin arc coupling in the system is weak, fairly weak. And despite that, you see this ten percent jump here in, in that case, and it is entirely uh, because of the change in the spin structure that the electrons are coupling to uh, the fan phase. Um, in such a way that it enhances uh, the, the magnetic resistance. But the, the fact why this, there is a large drop in magnetic resistance here uh, is, is quite interesting. And the fact that they are appearing at different magnetic fields is also another thing. We checked, we you know, whether it was because of uh, some sort of uh, the um, artifact of the measurements or, you know, uh, uh, that was not the case. And, um, you know, but when we plot it as comes in the magnetic moment, amazingly, it is too high. Uh, concept and actually in all, right? So this kind of feature where there is no change in magnetization, changes the magnetic resonance, it indicates some sort of change in the electronic structure. And we realized that when, when uh, Igor did the calculation, he found that we get into this blue band that has uh, our spiral means in zero. Band. And the uh, green and the red bands are the uh, bands in the four square magnets. And it's very complicated to do in, in intermediate uh, state. But uh, at least the difference here is very clear is that in, uh, in the first experiment, state, there is this uh, positive black band appearing at uh, the Fermi energy. And that enhances the uh, conductivity along the C axis that drops uh, the magnetic in that system. So this is kind of a magnetization induced a little tangent. So little tangent is a change in the electronic structure. Right? Uh, so it can be driven by pressure, by doping. Uh, sometimes even in uranium dichloride, the magnetic field can do that. But this is the, probably the first time we are seeing that the magnetic is entirely magnetization driven uh, liquid transit in this system. Uh, and then now, uh, you know, enough about this um, one uh, if magnetic system. Now, you know, as a synthesis person, what I want to do is that, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, that we can tweak the properties and change, uh, you know, uh, replace these uh, different elements. Okay, uh, replace these different elements. 
And here we try to kind of uh, you know replace this ectam with cadmium, and then what it does is that it adds an extra interaction here, right? And then, then this makes the system very interesting. What we found is uh, that uh, you know this there is a spin reorientation that happens at about you know, um, you know uh, ten kelvin in the system. Here the spin side is a very magnetic because uh, the perfect and man is uh, ordered in different uh, direction. Uh, and then uh, you know they are in plane, but they go out of plane as you decrease the temperature. And, and a simple analysis um, uh, led us to um, the conclusion that it is uh, because of the competing anisotropy between terbium, which is blue, and then a manganese, which is this red, at, at uh, higher temperatures, you know, uh, the manganese uh, wins uh, the anisotropy of manganese large, so it tends to keep this um, more moments in the plane. Whereas when you when we go below the uh, uh, the anisotropy of terbium becomes larger. And that leads this uh, uh, this piece to orient um, along the c-axis, and then there is uh, the, there is this interesting um, you know paper about this material where uh, you know has been claimed that uh, you know there is the interesting turn gap state in this material, and that the turn gap state, as I mentioned earlier, is responsible for this kind of linear behavior in uh, uh, resistivity. But we found slightly different because this. Our data looks very similar to that data, not, not that different, maybe slightly different values, it's not, not important. But you know, look, this is a straight line that I treated in a, in a linear scale of this and then plot it in a, in a log scale. The straight line should look like that, not like that. And when we you know plot the conductivities, the conductivities don't show this uh, uh this square behavior. That is that is the square behavior, right? This black curve should go like that, I mean, so showing this, you know. This uh, kind of behavior, but it, it has a large intrinsic um, uh, anomalous bulk conductivity, and I, I, I'm not showing that kind of data here. Maybe I'll talk that uh, during uh, Friday, Friday on Friday during the workshop. But the fact that when Igor did the calculation, what we found in this system is that the Hall effect in this system is coming entirely from uh, different bands, not from the peak and k prime bands. So one thing that we learned from this is that we have to be really careful. So See, the idea in, in the chemical system was coming from a two dimensional uh, um, system, right? Now, here we have a three dimensional system, and it's already ferromagnetic. So, ferromagnetic, you know, you know, whether it is chemical or whether they have Dirac or not, you, you expect to get because the bands split, and you expect to get uh, some sort of anomalous of contribution to this system. So this seems like it's coming from other bands, uh, mostly. And, and, and uh, you know, very many is good contribution. From the PMK prime. That's that's what we found. Then we kind of uh, you know try to replace this thing, and again, see again, this is again this strategy of, of changing uh, human properties of the material, right? So what happens because there are two three different inequality in size. Let's you know replace this T. We tried to put a lot of tin, but we ended up getting you know we could not get more than uh, two things going in uh, germanium going into it, the maximum we get. And we realize that it prefers going only to this side uh, with X analysis, areas, as well as ego calculated, and then his calculation so says that this is most the energetically favorable place for the, the germanium to go. Now, how it tunes the property is pretty interesting again. Let's see the magnetic properties here. This is jump here, then there is a straight line, and then cost. The jump is still here, but there's a cost already starts here, right? And then it saturates. Um, so, and then when we look into these uh, magneto resistance, magneto resistance, you know, there is this linear increase here, uh, but you know, there is this 10%, about 10% or 15% jump here. That means all this are pointing um, that the system has gone directly from this phase to that phase, right? That is what I can say from this. Um, again, what we need to test this is to again, see with neutrons. Right. That's next. Uh, Rebecca actually went to uh, Australia to do this experiment, and then when she measured, now these are kind of they are not uh, you know like like this. There are these uh, you know direct events of plots uh, here. So we still can see these two big feature. That means you know this system starts with the incommensurate phase, not with the commensurate. That was the first difference, and that incommensurate phase uh, coexists. Uh, I mean exists. All the way down to the lowest temperature C is about 14 Kelvin. So another thing you know, that she found is that, however, is that the speed of flop phase here looks very similar 
at least in the different data as the parent of R. So, uh, and, and then uh, some, some sort of nucleus appears um, uh, you know, between, uh, you know, around, uh, around six Tesla just before entering uh, the pheromone phase. So, uh, you know, although this looks similar, the transport properties are completely different, right? That means that this thin plot phase, although maybe the spiral state, can be different. And how different? We don't know that. Um, and then, you know, some sort of like uh, on the line of doping, some other people's work is that they, you know, try to dope it with gallium and then they tune it uh, with paramagnetism. And again, the interesting paramagnetism is that if you have paramagnetism, you have access and you can open a gap and, and things like that. This is again a tuning uh, property. And another, other interesting things about uh, the, the Hegomi system is that now, you know, this, uh, this set of material, this uh, AVP um, uh, antimony 5 system, is getting a lot of attention, right? Because of discoveries of these two, two things is the one the superconductivity and just you know, one helping, and then the charge density wave that uh, is get, getting a lot of attention. And recently, uh, David Magnus's group kind of uh, reported a similar uh, behavior, at least the not the superconductivity, but uh, the charge density wave. The charge density wave in this system is different from, from that in this system, but charge density wave is detected in this system. So now the fact that you know this. Uh, I'll get back to that a little later. And then you know, I never talked about the electronic properties. Like the design is I started with this drag point, most interesting thing. thing. Does this system has uh, any drag point? Yes, it does have. This is this is uh, the uh, RPS um, that, that you now measure. Um, and then you can see this drag point. And we also did this, you know, went to a high magnetic field and then uh, extracted the this thing. It looks very linear, but we don't uh, know you know how much. Uh, this, this 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 point is contributing to it. Probably very less. That is what our um, initial calculation is to the state. And uh, you know, the fact that you know so many so many interesting features have already been uh, observed in this system, and still a lot of things to be done in this system, right? There are so many things you know in these uh, three uh, transmetal elements that have been uh, investigated. That there are other errors, and then the combination of this makes this system really interesting. Uh, so I will kind of in here saying just two things. That one is economic magnets provide a very fertile ground for the interplay of this, uh, electronic structure and magnetism. And the other thing is that just advertising this uh, 166 compound uh, provides a very uh, big family to work. And many things probably uh, are able to With that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, maybe I missed it when I stepped out, but that's the distinction between the anomalous hole and the topological hole. So the anomalous one is present in any paramagnetic background. So right. So that gives a very thing, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I forget, that's topological in of itself, right? Or not. I can't remember. Oh, so there are two origins, right? One is uh, you don't need to get the, the topological uh, or itself that's coming from the big completely from the base. Yeah. You don't need a spin arm coming. Okay. It can come even from the texture. You just need the spin to move through it and then get get that geometrical phase. Right? But from the for the mass structure, you need to have this spin arm coming. Okay. Uh, there are other systems. Probably uh, Igor will talk, uh, you know, uh, on Friday that there are certain anti paramagnets don't need uh, the spinner coupling to get them also. But that's a different story. Uh, yeah, that, those, those are very interesting new systems. Other methods. Yes, David. Uh, just a comment. Uh, it's what people um, that The systems I will be talking on Friday, they do not require paramagnets, but they do require a speed of coupling. And in that sense, it's canonical uh, a normal thought that except it appears in other incomplete phase anti parameter. Uh, while topological quality, as Yamal said, does not require the uh, topic at all. But it's still very phase and not more at all. So right. this is truly a stored type. Right. Yeah, it's just different very phase anti Correct. Correct. So in this sense, it's different, distinctly different from both ordinary and the Yeah. 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 Yeah.
practical question because this is a tutorial bit. Years gone by, um, they had all the knowledge and Okay, so um, your standard is the world resources, um, study of edge objects, access to not the dimension. Yeah, that, that's excellent question. You know, uh, the, the thing is that uh, then you know you grow out of the pin and then uh, you know uh, you have key linkages into the system and then how do you use that right right question, right? Well, even on surface, right? Right. So the thing is, uh, you know, uh, um, we don't eat our sample. We just rather polish them and then get rid of them. So susceptibility is very uh, uh, nice to, to uh, kind of uh, check your samples because team has both superconducting at uh, 3.7 million, right, and it has a critical field. The first thing is that you put in a, into uh, the PPMS and then measure with low field, and you you see the the diamagnetic signal. And you know that your sample is is uh, has a team inclusion, and then you need to kind of find either another sample um, or you know uh, polish it further. Right? We, we we tend to polish not to edge it because you know when you edge it, there is a likely chance that you are removing the team off from the material. Also, there is no guarantee that you are not attacking the team from that. So when you edge, well, you polish it. May happen, but uh, uh, you know, I don't know how that affects uh, at least the magnetic properties. It can affect the, the plasma properties, but probably not. Uh, yeah, that 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 remains that remains. Uh, uh, any student question first? Sure. Yes. Okay. So when you're showing the contributions to the the Hall effect. Um, how do you know which, like, how much anomalous hall is contributing? So, a uh, very, very good question. Uh, um, yeah, I think we have to right? So, you know, we use this uh, assumption that the anomalous hall is proportional to this. And then, you know, there's magnet, um, this, this magnetic moment, right? Uh, and this magnetic moment you can measure just like. Here, um, uh, oh, it's not here, but uh, you know, this row A is basically uh, calculated based on the, the magnetic moment. And what you need is the RS. This RS you can get by treating uh, this, this uh, saturated region. Okay. When you treat the saturated, uh, saturated region, you get a linear part, and then that, that part only there is no topological part, right? From that, you can get uh, both of these. Uh, one will be slope, another will be the intercept. So it's, it's from the data, but just fitting. Yes, so yes. You measure uh, the magnetic moment, and then uh, you, you use uh, this RS from that fit, and then you calculate that row A. That's how this row is calculated. And then, uh, then you subtract them, and whatever it is, is uh, the, the top row. Right, thanks. Paul? Right. That's a question. Yeah. Uh, one question is uh, for the um, future magnetic slide. Hong Kong, there was a fairly strong temperature sense of the intermensurate wavelengths. I thought that was quite interesting. And do you understand why that comes about? This is your magnet 166, right? Sorry. I went to the wrong. Yeah. It's a temperature. That was. This, this part. Yeah. The so wave paper changes, um, and uh, you know, I don't know why it changes that much here, uh, but it remains kind of a very constant. Just <laughs> <Good. laughs> well, the, the other thing that's really unusual. <laughs> Yeah, the other thing that's very unusual about that is that blocks in high typically incommensurate structures will block any low temperature. I just wonder whether there could be something about the, uh, the topological nature of band structure that somehow would this effect. Is it after all? Yes, yeah, that, that's always a possibility, right? Since uh, the other ideas. Uh, Drag at least the drag point. That is, you know, that is something that I'm very interested. In, but I'm not sure how much that contributes to the system. 
we have uh, the, the, that would be wonderful to uh, kind of explore um, in, in, in the future. It has this threat, very close by, only 20 million electron volts. But remember again, this is like one point, and there are many, many other normal bands. So, how much that one band can contribute to the whole system is, uh, you know, hard to think. At least if it was only that point, then that is one of my interests is, you know, you have this. This is actually a spin, a spin polarized, right? This could be a wild point um, because only one spin channel. Then the, the wild point in moment of space can generate uh, the, the uh, skarmions actually because it's a hazel, right? Skarmions in real space. Now, the, my, you know, one of my interests, and that is why I, you know, I started studying this, this Pagoni system is that you can have both uh, in the system, is that can you can crystallize um, the skarmion because of the wild point. And if it can, and what is the right condition to get that uh, is, uh, you know, something that I'm very interested in, but I'm not sure that this this point is. Story is even a, a, a bit funnier than that. The giraffe point that Yuan was talking about, which is within 20 millivolts, that's a three-dimensional distorted giraffe point. So this giraffe point cannot really. Uh, give you a substantial contribution to a normal solution, which we found. Now, the Princeton paper that had been before us, they realized that, and they also realized that there is another two dimensional Dirac point, but that one was 600 millivolts away from the Fermi level. So, what these fellows did, they just drew Fermi level 500 millimeters away from where it was calculated without any explanation. And by now, uh, three different groups repeat their calculations and discovered with big surprise that the picture in the paper were just uh, manipulated. <laughs> well, this will be a good discussion for Friday. Right. Okay, so, yeah. so we better uh, thank you, Mel, again. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so yeah, tomorrow I'll announce it tomorrow, but there will be a photograph. Thank you.